There you go. Greetings, everybody. My name is Kathleen Ian Ronaini Kelly, or a cat, as a lot of people use my nickname. I am presenting a class on resources for uh, lo locating material and ideas from around the internet uh, for your arts and science competitions, for working on your projects, whatever. And this is kind of my way of gathering all these, res some of these resources to give you an idea of how to work on your projects. Uh, my background is that uh, in the SCA, I'm a herald, a researcher, and an artisan. I'm the former treasure herald in the Anshira College of Herald. And I've been a baronial herald twice for the barony of Stargate. I am also in the modern world, I uh, interlibrary loan specialist, specialist, which means I work for universities, uh, library technical services, and locate information resources for our faculty, staff, and students. And I've been doing that for 20 plus years for interlibrary loan. I've been working in libraries for 40 plus years total. So I have easy access to find resources for re research projects. And I'm also a daughter of a librarian, a niece of a librarian, and a sister of a teacher. So it comes naturally. <clears throat> okay, what is knowledge? Why do we seek it? Why do we want to use it? It's learning on subjects for school, for pleasure, for research. Uh, and in the SCA, that's a big part of our mission. In the SCA is to research and recreate the arts and sciences and actions of those who were in the Middle Ages and Renaissance periods. It's a way of everybody learning for the pleasure of learning and learning to advance your knowledge of a sub subject you want to attempt. And the SCA is devoted to research and recreation of pre 17th century skills, arts, combat, culture, other, other things, employing knowledge of history to enrich the lives of the participants. These are some of the, the categories you would find in a arts and science competition. And if you go to several, and I have a down at the bottom of this presentation, I have uh, the links to some of these uh, competition categories and their subsets. So this is a, just a few of the things that have been attempted in a and competition and for research. And I found that this is just, just a small tip of the iceberg of the kinds of subjects you can find in researching your, uh, your subject for that you want for an arts and science competition or just for your own pleasure. Uh, where is the best resource to locate information? Mainly is in libraries, the public libraries, uh, county library, uh, public and county libraries, and special libraries, uh, ca uh, colleges and universities, 
and a really good thing to do, and you have access to it. If you belong to a public library, which is city, county, or regional libraries, you can go to your interlibrary loan services, whether it's online or in person, and ask for information of how to find this resource, where to find the journal article, where to find that book, is there photographic uh, evidence I can find for like how to weave this particular weave on an ankle loom? Or how, what, how, what was the form that the medieval rapier community used in their style of fighting? You can ask the, the, the reference librarians in your libraries and they'll get you in touch with interlibrary loan services and they'll go on to go to town and, and submit your request to a large consortium of uh, libraries. That's it, that source is called the OCLC World Share ILL, of which I am part of that too. And they will locate them retrieve that book or that article and then notify you that you that it's uh, coming to you. And that's a really great resource. There's libraries out here, even in Texas, there's a thousands of libraries that you can tap into their, their own collections or they'll help you find materials in other collections. And it, and internet resources are out there are much more accessible than they used to be. There's more and more information, especially during this time of COVID, more and more information is being put out there on the internet. Reminder though, not everything is on the internet. Not every book or recording is on the internet. So you will have to look in more than one place or go to a library because the libraries have the print copies of some of these materials. Not everything can be put on the internet because of that, because it's just too much information. What is interlibrary loan? Uh, interlibrary loan, and I've shown the abbreviations here, is a server of service where a user of one library can borrow books or receive photocopies of documents that are owned by another library. And that library in turn can borrow from your parent, the parent library that you are at. <clears throat> it's a, it's a <clears throat> what's the word? Um, it's a way of each sharing resources to it alleviates a lot of the cost of everybody owning the same journal or owning the same book because just nowadays it's expensive for subscriptions and the cost of books are a lot higher than they used to be. Please note that textbooks are harder to get on the library loan. <clears throat> One other libraries hold those, those textbooks for their own patrons, their faculty, staff, and students. Uh, yes, I know the textbooks are expensive, but unless it's an older edition, it's harder to get unless you buy it yourself. Uh, and here's some of the reference sources where you can start looking for information that other people have compiled. These are really good resources. Uh, the online reference book for medieval studies has manuscripts and has research from other libraries on other individual researchers. It's a great place to start. Uh, the research uh, list for SEA researchers has a large collection of links to many resources for the different subjects that come up in 
the SCA research. It's really comprehensive. And so is the next one down, the SCR, Arts and, SCA Arts and Sciences homepage. You can find that, that link also in the SCA uh, main website. They have it under resources and research. That's a very good one too. It's it both these two res two um, links are really comprehensive because they break it down in subjects like a library and ma and make it accessible. And for the most part, they uh, update their links uh, as often as they can. Another uh, good place to go is the online medieval resources bibliography. It will give you a lot of uh, citations for books and articles that will help you with your research. Google Books is another thing. Google searching is a really good uh, research tool. And what they have in Google Books is that if you qualify the research, the, the, your search, you can come up with the books that are in public domain. They have been scanned and digitized where you can find books. And I found books as early as the, the uh, mid to late 1500s that have been scanned into Google Books. It's, it's called the Google Books Project. So you can find period resources. It's just knowing how to look for it. And then a really good resource called WorldCat. It's a large library catalog online. <clears throat> and you can research by different search categories and find the actual bibliog bibliographic record and then it also, when you go through that rec that record, you will find see what libraries possibly could have their resources, and will qualify those those that list of libraries to the closest to the farthest away. You can also with this thing, then with a free account, you can save your citations into a list, and you can make you can name that list. Uh, whatever you want, and you you uh, save the re save each of those citations for those books or articles into your list, and then when you're ready, they have a, a function where you can download that list. They cited the uh, books and article citations into a list, and you can qualify it as an APA citation, a MLA citation, or a Turabian or sh Chicago style citation. So you already have, when you download that, you can then copy that list and put it on a, a Word document and just clean up a little bit. And then you have your bibliography for your, your documentation paper right there uh, so that you don't have to, if you don't know how to do documentation, this is a great start. It's a really good uh, resource for WorldCat. I use the version with all the bells and whistles because I'm, I do interlibrary loan. I, get, I can find more things with this resource as the world share uh, ILL. Uh, platform, but it's a real good resource. Well, okay, it's really great. And the next one I have here is the online digital archives. <clears throat> Each of these these archives have PDF forms of these resources. Kathy uh, has a lot of uh, book collections digital book collection on their website. <clears throat> According to what kind of membership, you can pull up and save the whole PDF or print out a, a page 
of that uh, source that you're looking for, for a book or an article. Internet Archive Digital Library is really good. <clears throat> and you can search in different formats. And that, uh, some of them, the resources you can borrow. They have a link of way. You can borrow a book for an hour. Uh, others, you can download the whole PDF. So it's a really good resource. And then the Internet Medieval Sourcebook is at the Fordham University Library. It's really great. Project Gutenberg is another archival um, resource that ha has whole book, whole public domain books digitized to where you can pull up the whole book and do your research in that. And then uh, National Archives in London, which their parent uh, <clears throat> website is actually the law library at University of Houston. That's a good place. And in the other the manuscripts, um, archives at the University of Chicago. And then we go into our, we have our references uh, from all over <clears throat> the world, the Google Arts and Culture. Uh, website has a tremendous amount of resources. Also part of that website, they have the museum collections with links to over 2000 museums. So you can go into the links and pull up that museum and go to their research section and actually search and look for extant uh, photographs and research of if you're trying to, to uh, document a weave or a piece of armor or a costume, this will bring you to the actual uh, um, piece that's being held in that museum. So you have first source, primary source uh, material that you can access to put into your document pa paper. And it'll give you, also give you the citation that you can use in your paper, in your bibliography. The British Museum, the Victoria Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art are really excellent resources. And the Louvre Museum is also a really good resource um, entity. And they have done a lot of their uh, materials, not only, not only in French, they also do it in English. So it helps when you're trying to uh, do your research. And then did we have many places for digital images, for manuscripts, for illuminated manuscripts, um, it's quite a bit. Britain is a large component to digital illuminated manuscripts for um, medieval um, books and for even for many of their uh, royal decrees, they will have copies or locations of looking at actual charters like we would use in our courts, they have uh, representations here, photographs here. And performing arts, there's a large collection of performing arts resources, uh, especially the Bardic, and even one for Viking resources for those with Viking personas, a collection of music that you can download many of the the uh, scores man and music manuscripts and in some cases they have recorded public domain uh, music pieces so there's a great resource there and historical resources 
many of these were resources. Here, the circle uh, uh, for Irish chancery letters, the National Archives of, of Britain, uh, the other chancery rolls. These will have actual King's Court transcripts uh, that were transcribed back in the 1800s. And then in the 20s, 2000s, they have digitized these resources. So you can search by a person's name or by a subject and pull up that document, which helps with your documentation because you'll have first <coughs> primary source uh, materials. So these are really good. And if you're looking for the Domesday uh, participants in the, the uh, 1066 uh, invasion of England from William the Conqueror, you'll find the names there with genealogies. And then on Mastics and her heraldry, we have a lot of resources. Uh, the Dictionary of Medieval Names for European sources is a good place to document your name submission because you can find pretty much most of the, the uh, names in Europe, Northern and Western and Eastern Europe. We'll find examples of names and from those examples of names, you can actually go to the citation to where they found it in period uh, manuscripts. So it's a really good resource. It helps you document your name more precisely when you're trying to submit it for registration. <clears throat> a lot of other research resources. Google Scholar is a great resource because it, it will search several different resources at once when you put in your subject uh, uh, question. It's very good and it, it goes across many disciplines. So it's a great place to go look for uh, journal articles from scholars on the 1066 invasion of England or just find that certain cloak or costume that a Elizabeth had worn at the time of her reign. So it's a good resource. And then uh, there's <clears throat> monastic manuscripts project, which is really good because it shows a lot of the manuscripts as they were done. JSTOR is a good place to look for articles. <clears throat> you can go get to JSTOR through your public library. If you're a member of a public library or if you are associated with a university, you can uh, use that resource through, the, through your membership and I'll pull up the articles. Some of the articles you can then ask the interlibrary loan to find. Some articles are PDF form and you can download them for your research and then cite them in your, your documentation. Art Store is another. Uh, it's a uh, subset of the JSTOR. It's a really good place to uh, look for art resources and materials. Okay. And then we get into what you need to know for your <clears throat> documentation when you're going up for an arts and science uh, competition. These resources will actually show the forms you need to use when you're competing. What it will actually show you like the static form, the performance form, or the research paper form. And we and we do have that for for NGORA. It's on the the uh, Ministry of Arts and Science main page. Uh, and it'll bring up those three forms and also bring up the Gulf Wars forms if you're competing at a Gulf, Gulf Wars level. And this way, if you have those forms, you can 
make sure your documentation is is following the format that that competition would be for a different uh, ANS divisions and categories. It's a great way to really get on point with your documentation and your research, and also how to display your project in a most uh, agreeable format. And then there, they also have on the internet from different kingdoms, the, the judging criteria sheets where they look for certain things. Uh, it's a scoring sheet. It's basically the scoring sheet for your ANS display of how much, how authentic it is, how much effort you put into it. Is it more period or less period? It'll say using uh, period resources as well as modern editions. And when you have some things that you have to substitute uh, materials for your project, especially if it's using dyes or chemicals, they will take into account you using a safer chemical than mercury, lead, and arsenic. Because some of the, the the arsenic and some other uh, chemicals are used in dye and tanning processes for uh, leather and furs are very toxic. So they will take into account that you're using a safer, uh, more modern chemical to protect others. And they also will make a point in these documents sheets of herbs being used. There are certain herbs that, will, that you cannot compete with because they're toxic. And people, some people are allergic to those uh, herbs too. So this is a really good resource. It will help you immensely to get on point with your documentation. And then when you display, it'll get you on point to show it in the best light. Uh, fact bites. How many libraries there are there in the world? A little more, more or less 2.6 million libraries from, from small libraries to large university libraries. How many books there are in the world? Nearly 130 million books, give or take, to those published in the past 10 years to the present day. And they're printing out more materials daily. There's a tremendous amount of information on the internet. Not everything is on the internet because it would make internet slow to a crawl. Check with your, your city, county, state, national, and academic libraries. And even the Library of Congress is online to where you can look for a book that may only be at the Library of Congress. You can look for the citation, that material, and then let your interlibrary loan specialist, uh, reference librarian, uh, locate it for you. Um, and really ask a reference librarian or any librarian. They love good search questions. They enjoy the hard ones. It'll drive them crazy, but they will stick to it like a, a terrier and find that material for you. They know like I tell people, they know where all the dead trees are buried. So it's a good place to look is go to your librarian. They will help you immensely. And questions. Yes, I can't look at questions. Uh, Serena, do I have any questions? There are no um, questions, just a comment about saying that they love the luminarium and it's a great rabbit hole to get lost down. Yeah, a lot of these sources I put on a really big rabbit holes, but it's fun because then you can find it, you find that piece of information that'll make your documentation pop and really look good when you're in competition. It's a great place to go. Um, um, 
I work in libraries. So for me, this is, I have fun trying to find resources for our patrons. It's crazy, <laughs> but it's fun. But this is how you learn. This is how you grow as an artisan is by doing the research to prove your point about the subject you want to present, to prove, to prove that it existed, to, to, to present it in the best light and to inform your fellow SCA uh, friends and family and all that. So it's a great place to go. Yeah. And y'all, anybody can speak up and ask me a question. You don't have to put it in the chat. Hi, I'm Anatya. Um, I really like how you have presented so many links in one spot. There are many I've been using for years or even decades and some that are new to me. Um, one question I had when it's about the um, libraries and the sources, I noticed that um, the, the sources in this class and another one that I popped into briefly earlier on uh, the uh, three English winds in the Hundred Years War is there is mostly a focus on um, British sources. Um, there was something on Irish and at one point. The one region of the world they don't study is the British Isles. Um, I'm focused on the continent and I noticed that um, while the Louvre was mentioned, the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France and the uh, oh, yeah. BVMM is not listed. e codices in Switzerland isn't, the Austrian National Library wasn't, the um, Kirpata, which is the Belgian source for all things visual arts extant, um, it was is also an amazing source. That's Burgundian. Um, so um, those are things that I I miss when when I I come to a class. Yours is the first class like this that I've come across in all the zooming I've been doing. Not that I did all that much last year, but in general, people do not present such a comprehensive. Um, list of sources and you highlighted Google Scholar, which I use regularly. So there's so much excellent info here. The, the um, broadening the scope, especially now with um, the mission of the SCA to um, expand to worldwide cultures, um, of adding a, a, maybe a second class on um, archives in cultures globally could be really, really useful for many people. You've got such an amazing background. <laughs> uh, I have a, a sister who's a teacher or teaching overseas for um, 20 years, but last year she did a sideways step to become a school librarian. So um, it's, I understand the connection. So um, yeah. this has been oh. great. As I find more resources, and thank you for pointing out those resources, I hadn't thought about that before. Um, when you're trying to do a presentation, especially in PowerPoint, you have only so much room. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. That's... But as I find more resources, I mean, yes, that would be a good idea because archives, especially in this day and age when we can't go to a library, Archives are important and I've been finding more and more as I do research of archives where we can find materials on extant, which means primary objects that are put in museums. And there are a tremendous amount of museums I didn't cover because there's a wide variety. Uh, the Google Arts mm -hmm. and Culture Museum, uh, Museum Link actually uh, sites, tremendous amount of museums that have research sections where you can ask if you can download a photo or an article from their mm -hmm. uh, archives. 
So that's a really good, good place to go. Um, I'll check that I, out. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, I will do a class later on for archives. I will have to put it together and see, see what I want to play with. But thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, it's a class into its own in its own right, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so oh, ask but, any librarian or library per, uh, personnel, and there's so many rabbit holes we go down. I've mm -hmm. I've got in um in my college a professor who does nine different subjects when he requests articles, and it covers World War One, World War Two history. English syntax and English grammar, beekeeping, goats. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Goats um, on rooftops. That's another good one, but that's uh... <laughs> that. He's, he's doing things on, on agriculture, beekeeping, animal husbandry. He's an English professor. Oh, that's he fun. Goes in, he goes into these different research uh, tangents and he sends in uh, articles for, or book requests right now we haven't been doing a book request because most of the libraries in the country and in the world are having limited time amount of ways to ship or receive uh printed materials because of the covid has made it put a dent in our interlibrary loan services, but we can do articles. So there's a large amount of rabbit holes that you can play with. It's amazing uh, that list where I said some of the, the uh, subjects people in the SEA do play with, that's a small list of which is part of a larger list. So there's so many subjects out there for um, researching and presenting things for brewing, for blacksmithing, yes, beekeeping, yes, animal husbandry. It's just amazing of what you can find that people are actually doing in the SCI. And it's remarkable. And then I wish that more of those research in the SCA would put more of their research out there so that other people can uh, follow along and see what they can do with their research. Anybody else? We have plenty. I think we have plenty of time. Yep. Uh, anything else? Uh, I think it's just me and Jessmond in the class at the moment. Um, mm. So um, I, I okay. don't know. If, um, I do have some additional. Um, ideas on things. Um, I oh, cool. don't know that it is something I'd want to necessarily um, have on the recording because the direction would take you down rabbit holes and yes. it might be a little convoluted. But my contact information is on this uh, presentation and since you have the handout, my, my name and email and Facebook page uh, links are on there. Mm -hmm. So if you have further questions or ideas, you can contact me mm -hmm. out of class and we can kind of go down those rabbit holes together. Ah, uh, another you. comment that I did have was on the breakdown of, um, uh, let me get to the um the handout it was the breakdown on um arts versus science um i'm from north shield and um we did a breakdown of um arts and sciences in uh the last um year and a half it's strange because of covid to find that there's so uh much time that uh, we weren't together. Um, the, yeah. last, the last event that we held before lockdown was our um, North Shield ANS uh, 
fair. And um, we chose fair because it was not just competition again uh, with criteria, there was also a display uh, a component and a subset of that on experimental archaeology where our queen Jeanette sponsored a, um, that it was show us what you've done even incomplete projects are great show us your failures but tell us what you learned from it and there were as many who participated in display and experimental archaeology actually i think a few people more than there were in the um ans competition part itself so by expanding the scope there was much more participation that was uh, she was inspired by Callenter's Queen's Prize. Um, so what we had also done was looked at the difference between how arts are defined and sciences are to, defined. And under arts, I noticed that much of it is verbs um, about the action of doing things, paper making, brewing, book binding, uh, paint and ink and calligraphy are techniques. The sciences, the functional arts was defined by um, materials. And we found that also uh, when doing the uh, research to restructure the ANS, um, which had been modeled on mostly a combination of mid and Calentier. Um, what happened then is instead of just five categories, here I see eight, um, the categories were expanded to 24 with sub -def sets under each that were uh, a number 145 um, oh, yeah. disciplines with room to define more. And so it, it was rather methodical. The, the levels were expanded to beginner, intermediate, advanced, and then the the focus was on tangible arts, performing arts, culinary arts, or food and drink, and research. Um, so it was, um, it might be useful to reach out to the um, current minister, Kingdom Minister of Arts and Sciences, um, for um, her information on it, um, oh. because it could. As a librarian, you may really uh, enjoy hearing um, the, the different system because it was quite different from anything else that we looked at. Um, it was like starting from scratch. <laughs> so, but it wasn't yeah. because there are all these categories as you've already seen on your list, the arts and sciences and so on um, um, that, that are out there. It was just synthesizing and combining all of the different categories in the different systems used by other kingdoms. Um, the Gulf Wars criteria and the East Kingdom's revamp criteria are the most similar. Um, well, that's good to know. I've been, I keep looking to see more category uh, lists. Because they, like you said, they've broken it down to subsets, and those subsets are where you can define what your project is. That's uh, nice. According to a certain um, art form, uh, research form, I mean, you can break down book binding to certain types of book binding uh, in the martial arts. You have subsets of the different kinds of of rapier fighting, where or, or the Lichtenauer versus Fiore in the uh, longsword. <laughs> yeah, I because I'm constantly looking for more of the category list because then that way you can better define how you want to present your your project in an arts and science competition. So that's why I try to, I'm glad to know there's North Shield because I've been looking for the North Shield one. 
Oh, yeah, it did well, not get updated on the website, unfortunately. Yeah. It was new as of the the event, which was on Leap Day last year. Okay. So, um, the, that should occur. Yeah, it it it's completely completely redone. The um the criteria the the oh. scoring sheets uh, were complete for beginner and intermediate, um, and the advanced was the previous um a only form and it um yeah. it did not have a food and drink option uh, we that was something new that was uh, done because performing arts and research are both ephemeral um the uh materials based arts and sciences are tangible um okay. we found food and drink to be um a combination of both you have it there and then it's consumed and it's gone and it's just the memory of it as the as you would experience with performing arts the uh food and drink also is something that is felt by all five senses while tangible is visual and performing is um generally something that is uh audible and while you can also view it, it's not something that exists beyond the uh, uh, act of performing it. Yes. Well, a lot of these, uh, on this thing, the division categories, mm -hmm. and then the next one is judging criteria sheets. Aiden, Bell, Kai, Counter, and Allen actually have the PDF forms. Uh, mm. where they actually, you can download that form and look at it in regards to what you're trying to present to the judges mm. and to the other participants. That's a good way to place to go. I mean, not all the kingdoms have their criteria sheets online. Uh, yeah, I except have, North Shield at this point. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, because it was nice to have that seat in front of you to where you go down. What am I trying to show the judge? What am I trying to present? How sophisticated do I want to be? Mm -hmm. Have I got all my resources? Have I got all the materials that they needed for that certain project? Uh -huh. It helps when you have, look at what the judges are looking for, then you can gear it not so much copying someone as making your research better, making your presentation better. It also helps when you are standing there talking to the judge and he, they're asking questions. Do you know what they're looking for? Do you know mm -hmm. what kind of questions they're going to ask? And you can gear your verbal presentation much better and more succinctly if you know what they're looking for. And that's Absolutely. why I'm on here so that you have a chance of making a better presentation in the competition and a much happier outcome because you know what is needed for your research, you know what you need to prepare your object of your research and how to present it in the most succinct form that'll give you more points. They mm -hmm. like it when you are prepared, when you're knowledgeable, some don't know your subject, so you're teaching them what you have found in your research about that weave, about kumihimo, about braiding, loop braiding, uh, how in uh, the retro community, how they found that certain defense for a counter defense. Mm -hmm. Everything matters. So if you have an idea of what, what they're the judge is looking for, you have a better chance of coming back with succinct answers to their questions. And then makes a lot better, happier, uh, ANS competition for you and for the participants and the judges. And I've been trying try to find as many as I could of these criteria sheets, 
um, and also what the categories they're looking for. Because like you said, they subset it. And then subset, there's subsets. So this is a really good way of gearing your project to a certain category. Because there's also a category that most people don't realize is less formal. It's called SCA Life. Ah, yes, we have that too. And, and that, that one is for some people that have a harder time re doing research and how to prove a certain subject. I have a friend here, Nancy Diora, who does wood carving. Because of arthritis in his hands, he has to use a Dremel uh, carving tool to do his carving because he can't do the original form form to do the carving. Mm -hmm. uh, and they then do and judges will take it into account because all of us are getting more mature. I'm trying to be nice. And in some things are harder to do if because of your eyesight, because of the arthritis in your hands or whatever. So having subset categories helps you define how you want to do your your presentation. Yeah, if you mentioned is the technique um, at Gulf Wars um, in 2019, there um, I was one of three judges for an exquisite bouquet of vanitas bouquet of sugar paste flowers. It looked like the um, still lifes that you would see in paintings, except it was all sugar paste exquisitely molded. And in the documentation, the um, instructor noted that she used a more modern technique for rolling, uh, creating and rolling out the dough because she had um, um, issues with um, her wrists and needed to have the more workable dough from the start. Oh, yes. So she, she was not doing everything completely from scratch. It would have hurt her. So we don't yeah. want that. There's accessibility that was very much- well, in she issue. documented it. Yes, if you she... document that, what you have to do and substitute, whether it's a technique or materials, the judges will take that into account because yes, there are certain things that people can't do or can do, and they'll take that into account. It's not a set in stone. Uh, when you're judging, you are looking for the most creative and as much as possible, most authentic format for that piece. And now that, that's a lot of, a lot of new artisans worry about. They say, oh, I, I can't do it this way because I can't physically do it. They take that into account. The judges will, it's not, cheating, it's making room for more creative presentation, making room for more uh, authentic, authentic format in the, in the space that you have to deal with. Oh, I can't yes. even be work in my apartment because it'd be a bad thing. <laughs> uh, and it's, it'll break my lease too. Mm -hmm. I like, I would like to learn lamp work, but I cannot do it in my own place because it's a fire hazard. They will take it into account if you go to, to a studio or whatever to do the lamp work. Just, you're going to tell them the technique you used, what the glass materials you used, the, the te techniques of wrapping it around a rod or doing it free form the judges will take that into account. They know that a lot of us live in apartments. <laughs> so they will take everything they, that you present into account. Prove it on your paper. Present it, a, when you put it all in a binder, say, this is what I did, this is what I couldn't do, this is what I had to substitute. They will take that into account. That's helpful to know. I've been, in I haven't been willing to enter any ANS because 
I'm not good with research or anything out, but also I have a lot of issues with my wrists and other things that I do make substitutions sometimes of how I do things that the way that might be done in period or other people do, I can't do physically do. So that's good to know. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I've done a lot of, I've gone into the internet to find what different kingdoms do for arts and sciences. The, how to do the documentation. There's a really good, uh, let's see if I can find it. Should be on there. Well, no. I put in here, and I have to look for it, uh, for writing resources. There it is. This paper right here is an excellent paper, how to write documentation for A and S. It's done by uh, a Laurel, who's currently in the Outlands. She's a former Anstiorn uh, Laurel. She put into a paper in her, pa her paper, how to write documentation for A and S. Is formatted like a documentation paper. She literally shows you in full form what each page of your documentation paper should look like for your project. Where things need to be, the introduction, the, the title page, the uh, body of your paper, what we're looking for in your paper. Uh, the bibliography, and then the app appendix is where you show photos and extant pieces from uh, from museums. She shows all about what a documentation paper should look like, and you can follow that format so easily because she's presented it really well. And I highly suggest that anybody who wants to do an ANS competition, that's the paper to look at because it'll give you step-by-step step what your paper should look like and how to format it in the best presentable place. And then there's a, two other um, sources, the Anstior Arts, the Artisan's Handbook, and then there's a Antier, ANS documentation made simple. These are great resources. Uh, if you have questions of how to do your different papers and do the different MLA, APA, and Chicago styles, the Purdue Writing Lab will show you how to format your papers, how to write your citations because they do citations in different format. With what I'm saying in MLA, APA, and Chicago is MLA is the Modern Languages Association. It's more humanities and arts based. It's a great format um, for doing your, your documentation. APA is the American Psychological Association. It's more geared to scientific arts, brewing, Venting, uh, cordials, uh, woodworking, many of those, those hands-on tool-based uh, disciplines, the APA is a better way of describing your exp experimentation and your tech techniques and what did, what did go well, what didn't go well. The last one, Chicago, is kind of a combination of both, but a little bit extra. It was originally done by Kate L. Turabian. If you're in the English literature uh, classes, they used all three of these formats, especially the, the uh, Chicago uh, format because it's more literature-based. So, Two writing labs are a really good place. If you don't know how to do it and you haven't been in English 
class in a very long time, uh, this is the way to go because it'll help show you step by step how to present your paper. Um, and but a side note, I also was an English literature major in college. So I tend to understand these resources a lot better because of this. But this is a great place to go. I try to just show some of them. There's a vast amount of other places to go to write on your paper, presenting a paper, what sources you need, and then you can go into different kingdoms and find out what they're judging and what you can do. Does Ansteora require written documentation? Um, depending on the competition, at a local level, they say uh, a couple of paragraphs or two pages, with at least some kind of bibliograph, big, yeah, bibliography. If you are doing for a kingdom artisan or any kingdom artisan competition, they want full documentation and very extensive documentation. Gulf Wars is even more. Gulf Wars, Penzik, Lily's Wars, Great Wars, they will ask for a large amount of documentation and more specific doc documentation for the discipline you're presenting. So that's like a good 20 pages with appendices for those kinds of papers. It greatly depends on your subject. It greatly depends on the judging criteria. But if you're doing it at a, at a kingdom level, you have to up your game. At a local level or uh, the smaller war, the gold, our uh, War of the Rams, also called Border Autumn Melees, they do uh, between a local and a kingdom level arts and science competition. So it just depends on what you are presenting at. I would say go for as much documentation as you can. It impresses the, the judge better because they can go through the documentation. Oh, I didn't know that. I like that. Hmm, I needed to ask one question. So each of them has a different format and extent of, of um, documentation. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. It's quite different in North Shield. Um, the mm -hmm. beginner level uh, and experimental archaeology, the, uh, the beginner level was similar to Calentier, um, where you only needed a note card with the object or what it was, the time period and the culture. And if, if you wanted to, you could expand a little into what um, was period and um, what you did. That is uh, actually all that is really required. And we don't necessarily say the citations have to be APA or MLA or um, Chicago style, just so long as they're internally consistent. And yeah. the um, person can, reviewing the project with you for the, the competition part, uh, and you are on the same page. And then the documentation itself, if you do documentation uh, the more extensively, is basically what did they do in period? What did I do? And why did I make those choices uh, for those the differences that I made? And as a result, it's made the it more accessible and uh, includes more people. Also, um, the verbal um, verbal documentation only is entirely allowed. Um, there an issue had come up with the previous rules in the. Um, previous year uh, where someone talked about um, archery um, for an hour, but uh, didn't, didn't have anything written. He's 
um, he's an archery research laurel and yeah. he he was uh, it's like he didn't have written documentation and yet the the um, rule set said he had to have it and we said no um, he doesn't have to have it the verbal is entirely um, um, okay especially since some people have uh, disabilities where they are find writing extremely difficult and so the requirement to have written documentation was removed from the, uh, the new rule set. So that is something you might find interesting. Though the new rule information was published on the Kingdom Facebook page and sent to the email list. Um, but it, as I said, it did not make it to the website. So um, that's why I'm thinking if you reach out to the um, current KMOAS, um, she should be yeah. able to provide you with any um, anything that you are curious about. Yes, uh, different kingdoms have different rules and formats. And I, I'm all constantly looking at the other kingdoms to find out what they are currently presenting, like Kaid, every year they come up with a new category list. Uh, so I, I try to update on that. Mm -hmm. Everybody's different. If a kingdom's different from a berry to uh, a full kingdom competition event, they go by different formats. They're not totally, and I wish it was, a standardized format across the board everybody every kingdom is looking at different at things differently in their own perspective um i would like to see more across the board just so any person comp competing in a different kingdom will have a better idea of what they're doing at a competition but it's an ongoing thing COVID made it really more accessible because we couldn't go to competitions. We had to do it on virtually. Um, and to put the time in to document your material, you are also limited by where you can access that material, including from libraries. Fortunately, a lot of libraries, including and in, here in the Stargate area, have upped their game on servicing their patrons because we cannot give them physical books or materials all the time. We have to do it in a better format. So we have gone to open access journals, uh, making access to special collections more virtual. There's, we've, uh, we in the library community have really been trying to make it more accessible for researchers to do their research because they can't go into a library. Many libraries are either appointment only or only curbside service. So we're trying our best to make it more accessible. And in the SCA, we're trying to make ANS more accessible. Uh, we hope in the very near future we can get into more face-to-face uh, -face competitions again, mm -hmm. but it's an ongoing thing. And this is part of this, doing this presentation I'm doing is so you, you can find the resources that you don't have to go into, step into a library to find. Yeah, including more people is so um, important and letting them feel that their work matters. Um, yes. the, the consistency across kingdoms uh, isn't there. There's individual yes. needs and approaches it, just because we are such a diverse population in such a large country. So um, it, it's helpful definitely to look at how it is um, addressed in other kingdoms. And um, that's the end result of doing a lot of this research. Um, 
I, I liked how you also mentioned uh, the rapier manuals because research in, in the category includes um, study of historic martial arts and anything that is a performance-based animal activity, for instance, where you've researched um, um, uh, training hunting dogs or falconry or that sort of thing. Um, so things that couldn't be brought into an event site, for instance. So those are um, some interesting uh, inner kingdom anthropology um, concepts oh, yeah. that, uh, that you brought up. Um, and oh, I just noticed God. we're still recording. We've gone completely off off book here. So I don't know if you would be able to um, uh, edit the uh, tail end of the conversation here uh, since it's probably not going to um, be of interest to folks who uh, came for the research and knowledge part of it. But I'm certainly enjoying hearing the um, hows of uh, Ansteora's ANS and in your approach and getting information from so many different kingdoms, that's really neat and uh, says a lot about your approach to research in general. Um, I, I appreciate that very much. Well, that's from a background of being in libraries and also the fact that I've been doing research since I was seven. And being a guy majored in a uh, English language and literature, it was what I have my bachelor's in. I'm more focused in making sure that all that information is accessible. It's part of why I'm a herald, it's part of why I'm a researcher in SCA, is to make knowledge accessible to all. It's part of what library people do, is we want to share that knowledge not just hold it for a few, but make it shareable across the board for anybody who wants to do their best in their research, not just for ANS competitions, for research in general, for your own benefit of brewing a really decent ale to making a brewing a fine wine or a cordial. The more information you have, the better you will do and making that beer or that wine or that cordial. Same thing with embroidery, same thing with weaving. I believe in making sure everybody has a knowledge. And I'm constantly, constantly researching to make it more accessible to others. That's why I do this presentation so I can inform everybody of what is accessible, what can you find and make it your own. It's interesting to hear you talk about doing research since you were seven. Um, I remember getting our first set of encyclopedias when I was um, seven and um, usually had a number of them out uh, off the shelf at any one time. So diving down rabbit holes at a young age. So um, I have an interest in this as well. It sounds like you are a strong advocate of lifelong learning. Um, yes. What was it that you um, found most appealing about your persona? Um, what was it that led you to, uh, to um, focus on a specific area of the SCA? Um, did you choose a time period and culture based on your English background or and, and some other factor? Well, for my persona and my, my SCA name, uh, I did it from a point of view of my own heritage. My heritage is Scott-Irish, Scandinavian, German, and... Uh, pretty much Western European. I come from it from the idea of being a, as my persona that I'm trying to write up, is a scribe in 1400s Dublin. 
to where I am writing materials for other people. And as a researcher, heraldry is up my, my bag. Heraldry is a way for me to do my research for others. I help them find the resources to document their names, hopefully to the end degree. And it's one of the best things I do is I help, uh, when I do heraldry, I'm helping everybody. In fact, when I go to Gulf Wars, I play in the Carol's Point all through the Gulf Wars. That's my fighting. I fight for everybody to get their name and their device registered. So that I'm coming from that uh, frame of mind because my mother's a librarian, my aunt's a librarian. My sister has been a teacher for 35 years. We believe in helping others, people find what they're looking for, for knowledge, for leisure, for study, for practice. It's just that's been part of my mindset from the beginning is to help anybody I can. I do that at work too. I, in fact, two of my coworkers not too long ago, because I had to do a interlibrary loan reopening plan. So I had to do some research on COVID resources and uh quarantine times for library materials two of my co-workers said you know you really should have been a reference librarian <laughs> because that's where i go to i'm i want to inform everybody to educate everybody in the in the many resources that can be found out oh, out there and for all not just for my own front thing but for all the heraldry is something that um, drew me into the SCA at the beginning as well um, and um, I love linguistics and enjoy seeing uh, what cultures names come from but I'm not as competent in that as I am in the uh, armory or the visual display um, so, um, at Pensick, I will, after classes during the day, head over to Harold's Point and help color and sometimes even draw um, submissions. And uh, they give you ice cream in the afternoon. Yeah. Well, Harold's Point is one of the most magnificent places to be at war because you will have principals heralds from each kingdom sitting side by side with new heralds and intermediate heralds and we we are going back and forth and going through ideas how do we find that japanese name how do we document the thing um because everybody's a specialist in certain cultures we're going back and forth and these principal heralds will, will have the administrative side of what can be documented and what could can. Uh, they know the center rules, which is this standing evaluation of names and armory something. They know the rules and they can help the other heralds say, oh yeah, you're right. Because what heralds are doing is trying to get their, all that documentation under submission exactly what it needs to be so that when you go to your in kingdom, decision meeting, it can be proven. And the simpler it is and better it is, it can be passed up to this, this SEA College of Arms and go through the process in Oscar, which is the online uh, commentary for all the SEA. The better your documentation, the more you can prove, the faster that submission goes through the process and the better likely that it will be, um, it will pass and be registered. Keeping it simple and sweet, keeping it documentable, 
will make your submission go faster because they don't have to prove every part of your documentation. They already know that you have done the documentation. They will look at it, find the source, ver verify it, and go on. So when you go to Harold's Point, you see all that. And there are people that come to Harold's Point just to draw. They just draw out the, the, the armory and color it. That's what they do all during war is to sit there and do that. Uh, we have names, name heralds and armory heralds just going back and forth and talking about submissions. So it's a great place to learn your craft as a herald. And it's a great place for submitters to see the process in action, to see what their submission takes to go up the line and get registered. So I highly invite anybody who's going to Pensick or Gulf Wars, go to Harold's Point and sit there for a while and you will get a class you will never forget. On the spot education, yes. Yeah. Um, that's, that's very, very good example of one-on-one -on -one mentoring or teaching. It, it, oh, yeah. it's, it's so important too that that's just such as this uh, hive of activity when when you're there. Um, so um, yeah, just don't wait the last minute to do your submission. <laughs> so and everybody does need to have a name. Um, it's it's certainly possible when joining to use um, uh, part of your real name or uh, and of your group or actually of any group. You don't even have to be in that group physically, as I discovered recently. Um, if you like another group's name, um, it's plausible medieval construction. And so uh, you might have a connection to it in some way. So um, that was interesting to find out. Um, armory is a very neat thing to have. It's, it's like your own personal, um, uh, not trademark, but it, personal concise ID, the, the, the visual speaks a thousand words. So um, everyone would know who you are just by seeing your emblem. And that is such a cool concept. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, I'm um, cognizant on everything armory. I'm better at names. I'm a better book herald than an armory herald because I'm still learning armory. It's a little more precise. There's less give in an armorial uh, discipline than there is in book heraldry. And there are a lot of great arm, ar, armory heralds out there. I can tell you several of them. One of them is uh, Master Tostic, Logio Sophia. I think I'm butchering the last name. He's a great armory herald. There's a lot of them. Another good place to, to see all that going on is go to a decision meeting. They hash out everything about a submission. And then there are heralds that will draw, redraw something that doesn't look quite right. They'll get the submitter and talk to them and say, how, how would you like if we redraw that more precisely to what you, your vision is? It's a great way to learn and uh, find what you need to do. So that's another avenue of learning is just go to a decision meeting and sit there and listen. Those are always fascinating. Um, yeah. The thing that I like about Sina as a, a book herald who does armory conflict checking as my, my favorite avenue, um, I find the rules under Sina are allowing people to get more period looking armory because yeah. they have um, made the, some of the really tight restrictions less stringent. And so with 
field um, only divisions. That is now, it uh, looks like uh, possible to clear conflict where in the past it was not. That's a, a new precedent. And yeah. it's also possible to get it where there's just one central figure, even if it's something like a griffin, um, if you have the exact right color background and color of your creature. Um, that is really nice to see because the armory looks closer to the period examples, the roles of arms. And I really enjoy that part of it. So the other thing that new people always need is clothing. And while we've always had heraldic consultation tables, um, one thing in Kingdom that was new was um, clothing consultation, where um, some of us would bring our clothing and textile books and set up a table so newcomers could get a range of options uh, visually displayed to um, come up with um, something that they really liked and it would inspire them. Some folks choose to wear clothing based on um, their, their heritage, but sometimes it's on um, something they like about a particular culture. And sometimes it's just, ooh, that looks pretty, I want that. And so that's what the clothing consultation tables were that is for. A great, great idea, a great su suggestion. I and didn't know if you did that in, in Anstiora. Um, I haven't seen it a lot in Anstiora, but since we have several events where there's a large amount of people at, we have heraldry consultation tables. Having a costuming garb consultation table is a really good idea. I'm gonna suggest it to our minister because that's awesome. perfect idea. Having a way for newcomers and and the large events where the newcomer comes to, to see what's going on to try to submit their, their name and device, having a way to see what the different cultures are in costuming gives them a better way of getting their garb together. And I, that is an excellent idea. Thank you for that. Sure, that's something everybody needs to attend oh, yeah. their first event. And while people can get started with Gold Key, eventually they'll want their own uh, attire and it helps that they have if they have something they can point to so others can help them get to their ideal much more quickly than you know just seeing what people are wearing at the event and not getting yeah. a, the full range of options that are out there like North Shields heavily Norse there aren't um, a, a lot of, of uh, personas from um, the middle period, we do have a large number of Japanese personas, um, uh, Chinese persona, one person is representing that. Um, and the, there's, there's a desire to get new people started. And so it kind of crosses disciplines between um, the uh, Arts and Sciences office and the Chatelaine's office. Oh, yeah. um, uh, but even people who have been in a while and like to time hop or culture hop benefit by um, um, talking to people. And it doesn't always have to be just the books. There's, uh, you know, we all have our phones, we can pull up resources. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, can help pattern tunics on the fly. It's really been enjoyable participating in those. Yeah. So cool. cross pollination of ideas. Thank you for <laughs> wanting to to start that there. And if people pool their books, uh, have a a library of books for people to look at at the table, yeah. um, that 
that is something to engage newcomers as well. So, um, and it affects yeah. them personally. And so it, it makes for a, a fun half hour. Um, yeah. Um, I have run coordinated project consultation tables. We have usually have the Kingdom Library there. It's folders and books. Uh, it's almost a hundred pieces of material. Oh my! So, and then with some of us, some of Harold's have it on a USB drive, so we can carry it to different uh, things when you different events when you can't carry the whole Kingdom or the local uh, baronial heraldic library. Having it on the a uh, uh, thumb drive and somebody have a laptop, it makes it accessible so we can have a table where we people can consult and, and find new ideas because that's part of what the events are too, is a cross pollination of what's going on in the SCA and how everybody's doing things. I tell people when they're starting out in the SCA, Go to the events, look at who's wearing what, what interests you, how would you like to wear it? But ask people about their names, how they came up with their names. Uh, me personally, since I live in the state of Texas, I will never wear Elizabethan. There's just way too much material on your body. And it's <laughs> way too much. And funny thing is, in our part of the country, we don't have as much events going on in the summer because it's, we get up to 100 and something degrees. Yeah. Same way in the North and North Shield and the East Kingdom and Ontario and all, they shut down in the, the full bloom of winter because it's hard to go travel from one place to the other. So their time is a lot of times is in the summer where they, they can come out will not be frozen to death. <laughs> North but Shield, there, North Shield there. has a lot of inside events. So we we actually have our two big arts and sciences events, our Royal University and our ANS Fair in the winter. One, the first is in November, the second is in February. And so people just get used to driving in the snow, but... Yeah. Um, it, every year when the snow hits, everybody has to get their snow legs back, their, their sea yeah. legs, but except you need to um, relearn how to drive the first big snowfall. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get used to it. And, okay. um, and then you have like Lokak. Lokak, even though it's June there, it's also winter there. Yes. So they they really have a bizarre time of it, and then anything below that this in the southern hemisphere, including Africa, Middle East, and all that, they're dealing with actually a, the opposite of what the northern hemisphere is doing. So yeah, you have to kind of uh, make allowances for ways to get to events. And mm -hmm. right now, with uh, COVID. King's College is online. So yes. it's, and I'm happy for that. It's, me too. it's been great. Um, and uh, it's it's allowed information and, and knowledge to be more accessible, to be shared more widely. Yeah. And um, it's well, it's definitely uh, an, an important thing and a yeah. kind of allowed the SCA to remain active during COVID, we adapted. Yeah. Um, well, and uh, during when we we're actually doing events person to person, the Kingdom of Anstiora is Texas and Oklahoma together. Mm -hmm. The Kingdom of uh, the Texas is huge. When we, you talk about Texas, how, how long does it take? How far is it from one event to another? We stay in hours. We do too. I say I'm in Amarillo, and it is the same amount of time for me to get to St. Louis as it is to Houston. Yeah. 
oh my <laughs> yeah just why i don't make it anywhere <laughs> yeah like from beaumont which is on the eastern eastern uh, part of texas to go to el paso which is in the western part of texas it's about two days that's a yeah. haul it's mm -hmm. 800 to a thousand over a thousand miles from one end of Texas to the other, and the same way from going Galveston to Wichita Falls. Uh -huh. So when you're talking about Canaan and North Shields Large too, yeah, it, uh -huh. having these online events helps because not all of us can drive a long way. It's it's just I did back in 2019 we had our 40th anniversary of Kingdom. It was in the northern part of Oklahoma. I'm from Houston. Oh, wow. It took two days because we couldn't drive straight through. It's a oh. long way. So having events closer makes, in, makes the commute a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But that's just the nature of Kingdom. If you are East Con Kingdom, I think Connecticut and Rhode Island are their own little barony. Huh. Because you can go through Connecticut or Rhode Island in less than an hour. Wow. Houston Dallas is up two hours. <laughs> wow. And I'm thinking from where my husband and I are at in Kenosha. It's a uh, 900 and somewhere between 910 and 920 miles to get to Winnipeg oh, in yeah. the Northwest. And it's also almost exactly the same, that range to um, Custer, South Dakota in the Southwest corner of the kingdom. And I discovered it's almost exactly the same between 910 and 920 to get to Gulf Wars. In each case, you have to stay overnight halfway there because it's just such a, a, a drain to drive straight through. It's like 16, 18 hours. Um, so uh, yeah, um, on Steora, it's just, oh, it's it's Texas and Oklahoma. It's only two states. Well, did you see the size of the states? Uh, <laughs> that's significant. Yeah, it's, so, um, it's an 18 hour drive to Gulf Wars from where I am, but oh, wow. you know, our instructor here is on the other side of the state. It's a lot closer drive for her. <laughs> I'm in the far <laughs> corner me, of the state. <laughs> for me, it's 418 miles from Houston to Gulf Wars. And uh -huh. I'm doing it by myself, which is not a fun thing to do. And I would suggest it. Uh, though uh -huh. some people do ride by themselves. You're crossing through Louisiana and to Mississippi from Texas and you're crossing over on I-10, two of the largest high bridges that I ever wanna ever drive over. Oh no, I hate high it's bridges. 45 degree angle. It freaks me out every time I have to drive over the, the St. Charles Bridge because it freaks me out because he's at an angle and I'm always worried about getting up to the top and going down. Oh, that it's would make me so. Then, so uh. I've kept the recording on because a lot of the discussion actually is relevant to other people because you guys have hit on a lot of things that somebody like me has no idea what's going on. I think it's been useful information, but do you want me to go ahead and stop the recording now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, when does uh, this 